So welcome everybody to today's discussion on responsibility, hope and strategy in times of crisis. This uh, discussion is a part of a larger event series that has been organized by Columbia Law School's Human Rights Institute, Duke Law's International Human Rights Clinic, Columbia Law School's Center for Gender and Sexuality Law and Just Security. I work at the Human Rights Institute and I'm the clinical teaching fellow at the Human Rights Clinic at Columbia, where I lead a project on advancing human rights and promoting long-term peace in Kashmir. As you all know, our speakers today are Catherine Sickink and Cesar Rodriguez Garavito. Neither of these leading uh, scholars and advocates can be described and their work and contributions to the human rights field are hard to describe in one sentence, but I'm going to do that anyway, just so we can turn quickly to them. Catherine is a professor of human rights policy at Harvard Kennedy School and works on international norms and institutions, transnational advocacy networks, and the impact of uh, human rights law and policies and transnational justice. Cesar is a visiting professor of clinical law at NYU, is the founder of Just Labs, is the director of Open Global Rights, and is an advocate and scholar in the areas of human rights, environmental rights, and indigenous rights. In today's discussion, Catherine will discuss her new book, The Hidden Face of Rights Towards a Politics of Responsibility, in which she explains that in order to fully implement human rights and ensure that these rights are enjoyed, we need to move beyond um, the responsibility of just state actors and instead focus on the responsibility of all actors to take collective action to in ensure that these rights are enjoyed. She'll also uh, briefly discuss how her interests in rights and responsibilities came about and how this emerged from her research on the origins of international human rights law that places an emphasis both on rights and responsibilities. Based on lessons from his work, Cesar will discuss the need to actively shape the narrative about the current context so that any story that emerges is one that is rooted in hope and solidarity as opposed to fear. He'll also talk about the need to complement on the ongoing dominant mode of action of the human rights field, which is to call out perpetrators of human rights abuses with forward looking actions and proposals that look ahead and anticipate what is needed when the current crisis subsides. And although this series and this particular talk are focused on the current pandemic, what Catherine and Cesar will be sharing today are incredibly relevant, not just to the current reality, but well beyond that. Their lessons today that they'll share will be just one more example of how their scholarship and advocacy has a profound impact on how the field should operate and should begin to innovate. In terms of the format for today's discussion, uh, both Catherine and Cesar will speak for 10 minutes each before we move into Q&A. And if anyone wants to ask questions, even as they're speaking, feel free to tweet uh, questions using the hashtag COVID-19 justice or use the Q&A function at, at the bottom of your Zoom screens. So uh, Catherine, let's start with you and then move over to Cesar. Okay. Uh, thank you. First, I, I really want to thank the organizers and the sponsors of this virtual event, especially Columbia University Law School and its Human Rights Institute. And I want to thank Gulika Reddy for serving as our, our, our moderator. Uh, and it, as ever, it is a pleasure for me to share a panel with Cesar, who is a long time collaborator and friend. So I also want to say one good thing about virtual events is that I'm joining you from my sabbatical uh, in Uruguay, in South America, something that, uh, that I wouldn't be able to do if this weren't a, a, a virtual event. Um, so, so obviously, we all know human rights issues are central to the coronavirus crisis. And so our individual and our collective rights to health uh, and in some cases, the right to life itself are at stake. But also our, our right to liberty, freedom of movement, education, information, food, and shelter. 
are all at stake. And I think importantly, and I think we're really starting to find this now, is that people's rights to be free from discrimination are particularly in play. And it's already clear that COVID-19 places undue burdens on the poorest and the most vulnerable parts of the population. So as Gulika said, I wanna talk about my new book uh, because many of the ideas in the book are really pertinent to the coronavirus situation. Even though, of course, I, I, I don't mention it all in the book, which was published in January, because it, it, it wasn't part of uh, our life as I was doing the research and writing. The book, as Gulika said, is called The Hidden Face of Rights Toward a Politics of Responsibility. It's published by Yale Press. And in it, actually Gulick already gave such a good summary, I barely need to do it. But basically this notion that to fully implement human rights, we need to place more emphasis on responsibility of all actors and not just states to take action together to make sure rights are enjoyed. So first let me clarify, because this is a group, I think mainly of lawyers and law students. And so the first thing I have to say is my argument is not at all about new legal responsibilities of any actors. Okay, so this is an argument about the need for ethical and political responsibility. Um, and in the book, I, I draw on work of political theorist Iris Marion Young, and in particular her book, Responsibility for Justice. Uh, and in it, Young argues that we need to take forward looking responsibility. Uh, and so this is something that Cesar and I will both be talking about today because I think we've both been influenced by uh, Iris Young's work. So what Young argues that forward work responsibility means that all actors that are socially connected to an injustice and able to act need to work together to address the injustice. So we can contrast forward looking responsibility with backward looking responsibility the liability model, who's to blame, who can be sued or prosecuted criminally. Now, as you know, the liability model is the main legal model of responsibility. And I believe in the liability model for many human rights violations. I've written a whole book on criminal accountability for mass atrocity called The Justice Cascade. But many human rights issues are not well handled only or primarily through backward looking responsibility. I want to begin with an example uh, because just today I published an op-ed I wrote with Carrie Booth Walling. We published in the Spanish edition of the New York Times. Um, and it's about the failure of the UN Security Council to take responsibility for any action in this crisis. I don't know if you've noticed, but the UN Security Council has been, as the New York Times said the other day, missing in action. Okay, it has ignored its responsibility to take action in this crisis. And it's done so because the P5, the permanent five members, except France, are caught up with their parochial concerns. And both China and the US are thinking mainly about backward looking responsibility. The Trump administration insists perversely on blaming China for the crisis. You know, the whole thing about this is the Chinese disease. And China, of course, wants to avoid such blames at all costs. And so as a result, the Security Council is deadlocked. But it's, it's too late for the blame game. And so in this op-ed, uh, we argue that the situation of great power deadlock uh, needs to be broken by the 10 elected members of the council. And many of them are small countries, like the Dominican Republic is the current president of the Security Council, Estonia, but also Germany, South Africa. And these elected members need to, to, have, to step forward, take responsibility to step forward to support France. France has been the only great power that's, that's tried to, to put forward a resolution. And they need to nudge the council towards forward-looking action. Uh, and we're suggesting this forward-looking action probably has to start with something as simple as a presidential statement, not a resolution. But a presidential statement could be the, the, the first step towards more action. And, and th they need in particular to back up Secretary General Antonio Guterres for action. Guter uh, Guterres has already called for a global ceasefire, but the Security Council has been silent. They haven't backed him up. And they also need to back up the incredibly important work that WHO is doing on the pandemic. Um, 
And so th this is one way to think about responsibility of all actors, not just states, but also international organizations and states acting within international organizations, um, but also uh, governments at other levels, state and municipal governments who in the United States have been stepping forward in the absence of US federal government action. Uh, but also there's responsibility for NGOs, for universities, and even for individuals. So imagine, even if all governments were taking efficient action, and we know they're not, but if individuals also didn't do their share, staying home, washing their hands, no country would be able to bend the curve. And many, many individuals have stepped up to take responsibility. But others didn't, you know, as we saw with the crowded beaches of Florida during spring break or the crowded streets of, of Mardi Gras in Louisiana. So governments in this context, we need to, to strike a balance between protecting our collective right to health, taking responsibility for, for protecting our collective right to health and respecting some other human rights like our right to movement, let's say. And so a quarantine is a legitimate and necessary state policy in times of health emergency. But the state still must attend to the rights of individuals caught in the quarantine, rights to adequate health care, to food, to shelter, et cetera. Um, and no amount of emergency can justify some of the discrimination that we are beginning to see. So as my colleague at the, at the Carr Center for Human Rights at the Harvard Kennedy School, Jackie Baba, has recently uh, uh, stressed that pandemics have a paradoxical impact. On the one hand, they don't discriminate between rich and poor nations and individuals. And in fact, uh, uh, Max Roser, who does a terrific, <laughs> terrific website called All Our World in Data. And if, if you don't follow him on Twitter yet, he's really worth following him on Twitter. Mac, Max Roser, Our World in Data, they've got the best data right now on, on COVID-19. But Roser has actually shown there's a strong correlation so far between the wealth of the country and the number of cases and deaths. And we have seen that some of the richest and most privileged people have also been affected. But what we're now starting to see is that inequality is playing a big role in people's ability to protect themselves. Their ability to self-quarantine, to access services such as quality health care. And the pattern of deaths within wealthy countries like the United States is revealing these patterns of inequality. And so the poorest, the most vulnerable people will bear the brunt of the crisis and deserve the greatest attention from governments, but also from other actors. And here we're talking about the homeless, the incarcerated, those who are confined to overcrowded nursing homes or refugee camps are at the most risk now and going forward. Um, so in ordinary times, people uh, sometimes like to talk mainly about their rights and less about their responsibilities to the community and duties to promote the rights of others. But this extraordinary situation that we live in reminds us that the rights of all are linked intrinsically to responsibilities to the broader community. Uh, so, you know, in some cases, our, our responsibilities are simple and they may not be onerous to stay at home, to avoid unessential travel, to wash our hands, to cover our mouths, but also to be informed, not to panic, not to hoard essential items like hand sanitizer. Um, but we also have responsibilities to support health workers or sanitation workers or the workers delivering food who don't have the luxury of staying at home. Um, in other cases, there are people who are going way beyond these more straightforward responsibilities and really doing more to work collectively to help those who are most vulnerable. Um, but I think we also have a responsibility to think about what comes next and what we need to do after the pandemic. And I believe that we have the potential to move the world in positive directions after the pandemic if we think seriously about the lessons we're learning. You know, there's many lessons, and I know that CESA will be talking about this as well, but I, we're learning that we need more, not less, international cooperation and governance. We're learning that the tremendous inequalities in our society put way too many people at risk. But we are also learning that we, and here I'm going to say we privileged people, 
we're traveling too much in ways that were harmful to the environment and that maybe we can return to a somewhat simpler way of life that would be better for our health and for our planet. So I, I just want to end with the idea that, that uh, you know, I'm never talking about responsibilities instead of rights but rather I'm talking about the importance of putting rights and responsibilities always together in a framework of thinking about action, how to move forward so that everyone can enjoy rights more fully. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was incredibly helpful. And I think what you said about how rights are connected to responsibility. And I think if people sort of take the idea that you've left them with, it may also help alleviate some of the fear or lack of control or sense of helplessness when, you know, the agency is put back uh, into their hands. And I think what you said about responsibility now uh, is important, but also we shouldn't be short, you know, I think we, we often see situations where people forget the lessons when you return to some sense of normalcy. So it's important to sort of be, to think, um, to be forward looking as well in this moment and, and remember the lessons we learned now a few months or years from now. And I think that's a good seg to what Cesar is going to be speaking about, which is forward looking strategies at this time. Thank you, Gulika, and thanks to the organizers of this event. Um, and uh, it's always a pleasure for me too to be on a panel in person, virtual or in any format with Catherine, as it will become readily apparent her work has deeply influenced my own scholarship and practice. So I'm very glad to be here with all of you. So some of you may have seen, uh, read a very compelling article published by Indian novelist uh, Arundhati Roy uh, entitled, The Pandemic is a Portal. So I wanna begin with a short quote from the last couple of paragraphs uh, of that um, um, beautiful op-ed. Quote, historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine the world anew. This, is, this, this one is no different. It is a portal a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. Um, after reading that, anything I say will, uh, unquote, will sound both not at all eloquent and relatively silly, but I'll do my best. Uh, it's a hard act to follow and I set it up uh, myself. Uh, but uh, the key thing here is because the, the text is um, provoking quite a bit of debate. Uh, and uh, some people read it as uh, some that real saying, well, everything, uh, this is a clean break with the past. Now the, the future is, uh, full of fresh possibilities. And I tend to be a, 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 half, a, a glass half full type of person and, and practitioner and, and scholar. But uh, I think we need to ask ourselves um, without any, doing any futurology, what might happen? What could we anticipate might happen so that we can, as a movement, I'm gonna be speaking of the human rights field or space or movement as a, as a whole for now for uh, brevity uh, sake. Uh, once the pandemic has subsided. It will be around for a while, but it will pass. And the question is, how is it that we can anticipate what will happen so that we can shape it? And one can see a lot of crystal ball reading these days, right? The pessimists see uh, actions like the ones being implemented by uh, Viktor Orban in, in uh, Hungary or Netanyahu in Israel and so on uh, as further entrenchment of already concerning trends of uh, populist authoritarian leaders pushing back against human rights values and institutions. And so the pessimists have a point. But also you can read this in a more optimistic, through a more optimistic lens and see that the impossible has already happened, right? So basic universal income was supposed to be impossible, uh, unaffordable, uh, universal access to healthcare in the US was supposed to be 
uh, uh, no go zone and uh, and and yet something approaching or something that the seeds of that has have already happened even in um, in a country like the US that's quite inimical to this solidarity based measures because for example testing whenever that becomes available uh, here in the US uh, will be administered for free so it is true that uh, governments and societies can afford to uh, provide some basic uh, good and, and, and uh, one thing that uh, we do know, and this is what uh, Arunati Roy, I think, is putting on the table, is that we're at a critical juncture. And this is a, no longer an, a resource from, um, from literature, but from the social sciences. Uh, I'm very glad to see that sociology is coming back. We spent 30, 40 years thinking that societies are made up of individuals and there are no collectives, no collective um, patterns. My PhD is in sociology. I'm very glad to see how sociologists are being asked to uh, rehash some old ideas like collective solidarity, like uh, ideas for uh, long-term uh, trends. And one uh, specific idea from historical sociology is that ideas matter at a time of crisis uh, because people are disoriented, because people are hunger are, are hungry for for uh, new contents, because people are at a loss. So the the usual paradigms of of, uh, of thought and action are shaken up. And, and this is how, this is a moment of opportunity also for uh, human rights practice. Now, the usual or the most, uh, the dominant reaction, the instinctive reaction that at least I see in the human rights movement so far has everything to do with the kind of the backward looking liability uh, centered uh, model of human rights, which as Catherine said, and I have written also, is absolutely essential to human rights work. It's made fundamental contributions for, to human uh, accountability for human rights uh, uh, violations for many decades now. And that has certainly quickly translated into one after another initiative at tracking down abuses around the world. So there are a number of important portals, uh, not of the uh, lateral type, but of the uh, platform type, a web platform type, that uh, are tracking down the emergency measures being adopted by one government after another and trying to figure out where, whether those will be, uh, those are consistent or inconsistent with the human rights norms. So that, that, that calling out of abuses, that, that naming and shaming uh, work is absolutely fundamental. But I wanna argue that it is not enough. Uh, and this, I, uh, this is one of the uh, ideas that I've taken from colleagues like Thomas Coombs at Jazz Labs and from, um, uh, Catherine's own work, uh, previous book, the thing is that Catherine publishes so fast and such good content that uh, now her great book is already not her latest book. So uh, uh, Evidence for Hope uh, is the book that uh, has influenced my thought about how to think proactively about uh, human rights. And, uh, and what that means is to stop being always on the defensive, to always be reactive, to always be kind of uh, behind the curve of the developments and narratives that have been set by human rights violators, by the populist authoritarians of the world, by the, by the, by the architects of technological dystopias and, and surveillance capitalism. Um, and that actually, this more proactive, more overlooking hopeful view jibes well with findings from uh, surveys that show, for instance, that the members of Generation, uh, Generation Z uh, around the world are tired of being told what, what they cannot do. They wanna know what they can do. And, and I think that that feeling, that sentiment is cutting across different generations. We've been told to stay home. We've been told to not do uh, uh, one thing after another for good reasons. But then the question is, what can we do? Um, and that entails, and this is where uh, I wanna put on the table just for discussion a, a few concrete uh, proposals that some organizations are trying out uh, around the world that might uh, represent this uh, hope-based uh, forward-looking approach to uh, human rights, which by the way, uh, and I've written uh, about how the human rights uh, movement needs to learn more from other fields. One, one field that I think provides a lot of inspiration and very specific action ideas, uh, uh, is journalism. Um, I, I, some of you may have heard about the Solutions Journalism Network or the work of a great organization called the Constructive Institute. 
uh, that basically have done the same for journalism that I'm proposing to do for human rights. Acknowledge that investigative journalism of the of the um, of the denunciation type of the of the um, of the uncovering of stories and 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 uh, and uh, and shady deals is absolutely important, but that solutions and positive stories also have a place in journalism. So one way to see this is that this is a view that um, starts with add a plan to it. So Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who used to be uh, the head rabbi of the UK, uh, has a beautiful TED talk in which he says, well, optimism, I'm all for optimism, but optimism to me sounds a bit too uh, wishy-washy, a, a bit too ambiguous. I like hope, and he defines hope as optimism with a plan. So, uh, so because in the end, the future is what we do together. And, and this is, I'm going to leave you with a couple of uh, ideas for a plan. One has to do with narratives and the other one has to do with uh, human rights uh, campaigns and actions. On the narrative side, I'm gonna uh, simply quote from the work of uh, colleagues uh, Thomas Coombs and, and uh, Sean Luna and, and Lucas Paulson and others at Jazz Labs and also uh, in, a, in a project that they have been doing with um, the Fund for Global Human Rights. Uh, and they're about to come out with a hope-based guide for com uh, of communications in the context of COVID. And they give three specific pieces of advice. First, let's avoid the word crisis. Right? Uh, uh, Amartya Sen has written that while overcoming the pandemic might look like a war, what is really needed rather than top-down decision-making is participatory governance, public discussion, and alert listening by leadership. Different framing. Second, don't personalize, collectivize. Telling people not to go out to avoid harm is not as effective as telling people to stay home to help others for the common good. And this, I wanted just to show graphically this contrast by showing you, I'm gonna share my screen for a second here. The contrast between these two front pages. Right? Same story, completely different framing. On the left, you see, this, the storyline the story is many loved ones will die. Second one is together we can save many lives. So what I'm proposing or what my colleagues are proposing is that we use more of the language of the, of the front page on the right. Together we can save many lives while acknowledging the grief and the pain and the inequality of the current moment. And finally, one action point, and this is something that human rights organizations can actually practice in their daily lives in their, uh, now that they have to connect online is just do an exercise in which you start with complete the sentences, the following sentences. In, in the future, blank. In the future, we want to do this. We want to accomplish this. Um, because in the end, in OGR, Open Global Rights uh, uh, byline is reimagining human rights. So in the future, if we want to anticipate and have a chance to shape the future, we need to imagine it right now. Uh, finally, because my time is almost up, I'll give two just a flag and I can uh, I'd be happy to elaborate on some of these ideas in the Q&A, but I'll just flag two very specific proposals because people are already um, mobilizing around some of these uh, narratives and, and, and types of thinking and, and doing. And again, I'm going to try to share here my screen um, to show you what an interesting collective of uh, creative um, of creative uh, activists are doing um, to can you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Share here. So this this is to me is a brilliant idea. The idea that they're campaigning for around the world virtually is to free the vaccine for COVID-19 when it becomes available. So not wait until in a year's time, in a couple of years time, the same pharmaceutical companies, the same government hoard the, 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 the vaccines and apply the same intellectual property regime that has excluded so many millions of people from access to medicines. And we start to campaign, we have to campaign for that now. 
I'll hold on the other example and maybe uh, insert it uh, in the discussion uh, so that we can move on to Q&A. Thanks. Great, thanks, Cesar. I think it's, it's always really wonderful to speak with you because I think people uh, are often critical of the human rights field and the way it currently operates. But I think what's so wonderful about you and Catherine is how clearly you articulate a possible way forward and not just with ideas, but I, th I think what was so great is how specific you were with examples and you know, specific language and specific exercises that one can do as they're visioning a way, a way forward or imagining, reimagining a, a new reality. So thank you both so much. We're gonna to move to Q&A now. And as a reminder, people can either use the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen, or they can um, tweet questions using the hashtag COVID-19 justice. Just to uh, get us started with the Q&A with some questions that have already come in. Catherine, you talked about the importance of rights and responsibility and how critical it is when we're thinking about the right to collective public health mm -hmm. and as well as the collective responsibility that plays out. Are there other rights that you can think of or just other examples of rights that you can use um, where you could share perhaps what our responsibilities might be? Mm -hmm. So one of the issues that really, well, two big issues that got me thinking a lot about rights and responsibilities and that are featured heavily in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're, they're quite different. Uh, one of them is uh, about climate change, right? And it became very clear to me that people wanted to start talking about climate change in terms of individual rights or, uh, you know, even the rights of trees, the rights of rivers, uh, the rights of Pachamama, the earth goddess, right? And I'm not at all opposed to, to talking about uh, 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 climate change in terms of rights, but I think it really doesn't get us far enough and that we, we need to uh, think about our, our collective responsibilities uh, to uh, work together. Everyone capable of, of taking action needs to work together in order to uh, address the, the climate change threat. Um, a second issue had to do with voting, and, and it really uh, is one of those issues where in order to enjoy your, your right to vote, right, you have to also take your responsibility to vote. And I was very shocked because I was talking to Harvard undergraduates a couple of years ago when, when I, before I was writing this book, and they were just convinced they had a right to vote and they had a right not to vote. Um, and they really weren't thinking as much about their responsibilities to vote. Um, and in the meantime, since I started that research, and, uh, a, a, an amazing student movement has emerged where students are taking very seriously their uh, responsibility to vote and their responsibility to help others to vote. And faculty members and administrators at universities are taking seriously their responsibility to help uh, a student's vote. I mean, I'm a political scientist and I promise you that in the past, political science faculty virtually never talked about the mechanics of voting in their classes. They just assumed that my students know how to vote. But right now in the crisis we are facing in the United States, perhaps one of the most important responsibilities people have is going to be their responsibility to vote. And uh, so that is another area where this rights and responsibilities framework is really important. Thank you so much, Catherine. I think for anyone who knows me, uh, they know I enjoy nothing more than someone calling out well-intentioned people and pushing them to do a little bit more or think a little bit more critically. And I think it's, it's just so much easier to talk about rights than it is to talk about responsibilities. And it's so much easier to think about the very real external and systemic barriers to progress and harder to kind of hold a mirror to yourself and, and to people within your field. So just thank you for that reminder. Um, another question that has come up is, you know, when we're thinking about forward looking strategies or responsibilities, um, often groups have come together and assembled in the past in order to do some of these visioning exercises, or even if they've tried to advance rights, uh, things like protest and organizing in person and marches are, are strategies that the human rights movement has often used. 
um, and and that's just those aren't options in in this moment. So, uh, Cesar or Catherine, either of you, do you have any thoughts on how the field might think differently or leverage other kinds of spaces in this moment? And not just in this moment, but this is perhaps um, a time to reimagine new spaces that, in some ways, may become more inclusive <laughs> because they don't rely on on the physical space. Yeah. Lisa. That's a, yeah, that's a, I was hoping you would go first with this one, but this is a hard and important question, Gulika, because it, it, one thing we know from political sociology, again, social movement studies, is that the power of the marginalized of the, uh, it lies in numbers and being able to mobilize together. Uh, and, and there is a reason why in countries like Chile, the constitutional assembly movement has lost steam because it was based on a very vibrant mobilization on the street. Uh, and now that cannot happen. So we cannot underestimate the impact that uh, the lack of the possibility of direct collective action and the opportunistic use of, of the restrictions by some governments will have on, on uh, human rights um, causes. But just as that is a threat, the, here comes uh, the opportunity. Uh, for a while now, uh, especially younger activists have mobilized quite effectively online. So the Fridays for Future movement, which is, continues to be one of the most uh, inspiring stories recently in the social justice space for me, well, it, all, it, it happened as a combination of uh, school strikes. And now all young people are on compulsory strike. They are staying home but uh, they continue to mobilize online and they were able to disseminate this strategy of, of, of action uh, on Twitter, on, uh, on uh, Facebook, on other uh, online platforms. To the point that some scholars have called that um, connective action with a double N, as opposed to collective action with a double L, which is the type of mobilization of the masses of uh, numbers that we're used to calling social movements. So the, I see this as a time also for generational succession and for uh, younger collectives like the creative activism uh, platform that I mentioned is, is pushing forward this campaign on uh, freeing the vaccine. By the way, I'll share the link to their campaign on, on the chat in a moment. Uh, and, and that also creates an opportunity and a challenge for more well-established organizations. I think that many of those organizations are already rising to the challenge of learning how to connect with younger generations uh, and combine the best of professional advocacy, connective action, and collective action. Can I just say, because I really thought that Cesar's example of this uh, Free the Vaccine campaign is so promising and I'd like one I'd like to hear more about what they are doing but you can even start imagining a, a, a connective action campaign that w working on free freeing the vaccine and it w might be one that would involve you know start could have a, a, a role in universities for example where lots of research takes place um, and sometimes research with federal government funding that then provides private goods to uh, corporations, right? And so uh, I think one could even think of like a pledging movement as, sci as scientists and researchers and others who are involved in uh, basic research that has contributed to uh, some of these possibilities for vaccines could just start you know, being asked to pledge and saying, we are committed to freeing this vaccine from day one. And, and, and start big, uh, bringing pressure to bear. Thank you both so much. So we have a, a lots of questions that have come in from the audience. I'm gonna start with one from uh, Thomas Coombs since he was, re he was <laughs> referenced during the talk earlier. So he's sending in this question from Berlin. He's been struggling with how to use human rights to push the healthcare issue without simply making it an obligation for governments to fulfill an SDG in fulfill it in an SDG sort of context. And he wants to know how can we change the debate around how we care for each other, whether this is refugees or sick people or other kinds of individuals and populations after COVID. Mm 
Yeah, I think Thomas would be much better place to answer his own question than and I would, uh, because he's really the expert at developing this type of nar narratives that I, the action points that I quoted towards the end come from a document that he's preparing out of uh, uh, Just Labs and the Fund for Global Human Rights work on narratives. But, I, but from my background, I, I have done research and advocacy on access to medicines. In, uh, and uh, one of the things that struck me in working in that space is that the stakes are huge. Uh, the, the salience of the issue should be pretty obvious in that uh, and bodies are at stake pretty much. And this is what this pandemic also brings home. It's about the basic constitution of human beings, like physical integrity and life in the end. Uh, and yet that domain that of, of policymaking and activism, intellectual property and right to health, have been um, dominated by quite esoteric narratives and, and, and legal frameworks. So it's really hard, and I've, I, I co-published with Rochelle Dreyfus here at NYU, uh, a book on access to medicines. And one of the things that we realized in looking at norms around the world is that the, the, the efficacy of the pharmaceutical companies and, and global north uh, countries in pushing for um, IP intellectual property agenda has been quite effective and much more effective than the efforts being made by great organizations uh, around the world. My, my sense is that this is a way in which this pandemic might open up a possibility because the salience of, of health uh, as, a, as, a, as a basic need uh, of all human beings will become more salient. Now that window of opportunity is, will be short. So that would be another, this is more of a call for action than a, a, a response uh, to use precisely the type of frame that uh, Thomas has uh, advocated for focusing on, on future, focusing on opportunities and focusing on the connection among all people who will need and are needing medical care now. We have uh, another question is from Arpita. So she asked, uh, do you think that this moment also forces us to rethink our relationship with the state. A sort of renaissance of a welfare state perhaps with demands for universal healthcare and social security amongst others. Um, so first I do believe, I believe that the, the way that the great depression marked my parents' generation right there in their entire lives they carried with them some, some memories that came out of the great depression that affected everything they did um, and i'm thinking about the way that john ruggie wrote about something he called embedded liberalism so john ruggie a political ir scholar at at, uh, at at columbia and now at harvard university um and he also wrote there's this there was this critical moment the post-war critical moment in which the decision went to build a kind of in lib uh, liberalism, but one that protected uh, people's uh, uh, basic well-being. In other words, it was a compromise between international capitalism, but prote enough protection so that local needs were taken care of. And so I think that just the way the post-depression, post-World War II world was a critical uh, 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 juncture that led to different policies, that th there's a possibility for, uh, we are going to, our, you know, Everyone who lived through this uh, pandemic is going to be marked, I think, in a similar way to how the depression marked my parents. Okay. And now the question is, what is that marking going to mean? But I think it's exactly what the question was about a new attitude about the state and especially about the state and health and obligations uh, to. Uh, to to address health and awareness of how uh, the deep inequality has such t terrible health uh, implications, right? We're seeing uh, we're seeing out of New York City, right? That the the people, even uh, the people who are being the, the death rates, you can see it by by area, and disproportionately black and uh, poor people are dying at a higher rate because of poor access to healthcare and because of pre-existing conditions, right? And so I do believe that that is one piece 
uh, that, that will change, but it won't change by itself, right? It'll change as a result of connective and collective action, uh, people making demands in order to bring about change. Thank you, Catherine. We have a question from uh, Borislav Petronov, who works at the OSF Human Rights Program. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said great ideas about how human rights activism can shift. The challenge probably is that the movement needs to change a lot in how it thinks, how it acts, and the skills it has, and the tools that it uses. What do you see as the three most important institutional or organizational changes it needs to do to focus on a vision of the future? And I just kind of wanted to add to this uh, question to both of you. And Catherine, you, of course, must be familiar with the adaptive leadership class at the Kennedy School. And, and when they discuss change in that class, they say people often don't resist change. They resist loss. So what are the losses or barriers that the human rights field both and I, you know, they've raised, um, he's raised institutional and organizational, but there are also individual barriers and, and potential or things that are viewed as losses. So what would you both say are these barriers and how would you suggest that people reframe these losses or rethink how they navigate them? Well, so can I just gonna get started and I think uh, I think uh, this or can, can uh, add. But um, it's a really good question to think about what is, um, what's being lost. And, and when I talk about responsibilities, I do believe that the human rights movement reacts with some fear about loss, okay? And, and loss, uh, understandable losses. There's a fear that if we start talking about responsibility, more actors that will take the responsibility off the state, that will let the state off the hook. Right. And that's a legitimate fear. And I think we have to say, no, there's ways that by asking everyone to step forward and take more responsibility, that part of the responsibility is to make sure we don't let the state off the hook and we ask more of the state as we ourselves are, are, are doing more. Um, there's also a fear about blaming the victim. Right. That if you start talking too much about responsibility, that somehow there's going to be blaming the victim. And here I think we, we have to make a, an important answer there and that's saying that uh, as human rights activists we believe in empowering people mm -hmm. we're empowering people that's why victims often don't want to be called victims they want to be called survivors because by calling people victims they uh, it act it takes away their agency right and so the the the, the strength of a, a rights and responsibility framework is that it involves empowering people to take action and not only see themselves as uh, uh victims waiting for action from the state. Yeah, <clears throat> just to add uh, to that, uh, a couple of ideas uh, in response to the key question. One thing that I uh, uh, think will be important and actually will, be, will become more feasible is uh, the nurturing of uh, communities of practice um, uh, that will operate online in ways that will bring people together, just like we're getting together here, but on a more sustained basis. Uh, so far, an, an organizational trait in many human rights uh, uh, institutions entails getting together in person, and that tends to reify and reinforce existing institutional structures, because there's only so much you can do in person, and that it tends to be costly, and it tends to uh, lead to an over-representation of older generations in the movement. So there's a lot less opportunities for connection for younger uh, activists than there are for, for uh, more well-established uh, activists and, 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 um, and advocates. I've seen, and I participate in quite a few um, the, the, uh, Zoom sessions these days uh, that uh, have brought together people who would have not otherwise gotten together. My hope and my aspiration, and this is something that we're working on here uh, at the clinic at the New York University and also other spaces like, like uh, Open World Rights and Just Labs are working on facilitating uh, conversations that are as effective as this one has, uh, has been, as well moderated as this one has been, uh, but that include unusual suspects. And, and unusual suspects mean uh, actors coming from 
fields that would not organizations or collectives that would not self-describe as human rights activists. Again, going back to the example that I've given, this is a collective, the one uh, running the, join the uh, Friday Brexit Camp campaign. It's a, mostly a, a, a collective of creative uh, artists uh, in collaboration, by the way, uh, Catherine, with a university-based network of students uh, that uh, Nika Chimsky and other uh, now well-known scholars uh, established uh, to try to push uh, universities to work on accessible models of, of, of medicine production. So that's that in, 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 in short, what I would want to see, I would propose that we try to do is to use this moment to promote better, more effective ways centered on skill development, uh, on problem solving, and that will include actors, individuals and organizations that would usually be excluded from uh, the movement. There is a lot more and there is a lot that need to be reformed. I agree with the premise of the question about the need for the human rights. Actually, I've written about the need for the human rights movement to have changed long ago. Now with this disruption, I think it is unavoidable. So we either embrace the opportunity or we're left behind uh, the, the opportunity of, of shaping what comes after the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But, but Gulick, I'm, I'm, I'm curious because I thought it was a great question. So how would you respond to that question? Yeah, I mean, I think this question of losses comes up in, in any kind of uh, challenge to how the human rights or critique of how the human rights currently operates. And uh, I mean, I think the way I view it is similar to what you said, that if there are going to be other losses, if we don't, which are much more severe in many ways, if we don't address these ones. So, I mean, even if we think about something like thinking about mental health or well-being or sustainable movements in the context of human rights work, I think often we worry about, you know, if we cut back on this, then we won't be able to achieve our project outcomes and goals. But if you don't do that, then you're just moving towards a, a field that's not joyful, not creative, not innovative. And there will be sort of other losses that come with not looking within or with other kinds of critiques, you know, in terms of just say relationships between actors in the global north and south. People often use effectiveness arguments and say oh, it's, it takes too much time or too many resources to, to actually have equal transnational partnerships. But I think, yes, those are costs, but the other cost is that you're perpetuating the same harms and inequality that the field um, otherwise tries to address. And Catherine, what you said about, uh, you know, this fear of um, blaming the victim, I think I've often, when we do some of these visioning exercises in Kashmir with, with young students to say, what, what can education look like for informal and informal spaces in a post-conflict reality? You know, a lot of people focused on the what question and we've been focusing a lot on the how. And, not, and, and you know, moving them beyond what is it that the state wants and our Kashmiri partners themselves have said, it's important for us to not be stuck in victim mode and to view ourselves as agents of change and stakeholders to this conflict rather than people who have only been impacted by it. So I think victims, quote unquote, also agree with what you have said and view themselves as, as real agents of change. Uh, in, in this process. Um, we have several more questions. Uh, one is, what possible strategies can be fostered to improve international cooperation after this pandemic, given that closing borders and limiting travel may be the new norm for a while? And I'm just gonna add a second question since we're at the last five minutes. Uh, someone asked, are there any suggestions for one action we should all take starting right now? Uh, I'll, I, that's a great question. Um, difficult to answer uh, briefly, but I'll do my best. So a couple of ideas. One is the one thing that I would propose we all do is start imagining the post-pandemic future. Uh, think about uh, what will the world look like 
or uh, with the best resources and and if possible with tools of of foresight analysis or some sort of tools of of, of futures thinking and work backwards from there and imagine what we need to do now to shape that future and by the way this is a little plug uh, open world rights uh, which is a, a relatively well known portal in the human rights uh, um, uh, in the human rights movement in which Catherine published the blog version of uh, of her piece on on the, um, on rights and responsibilities in the coronavirus setting is running a blog series just on that uh, asking human rights practitioners and researchers to write about what we need to do now to prepare for the future. Uh, and uh, so submissions are welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, and that mm -hmm. I, will, I would leave it at that in the interest of time, but that I think is crucial at this moment. Mm -hmm. um, well, first, you know, I don't think it's possible to say there's one thing that we should all do, but I do think that like one, one important proposal that's come out of this is the free the vaccine one. And I would just like everyone who leaves this a group to keep the free the vaccine in their mind. And when they're talking to people, they mention that as something, you know, we all know that until we have a vaccine, everyone is going to need to uh, get this and mainly survive this. But once we get the vaccine, the crucial issue was going to be how well, how quickly we can d deliver this vaccine. So it's, it's, that's the, an essential pass towards the future. And I think the free the vaccine movement uh, is a way of raising consciousness about that next step. Um, I want to end on a note, which is a little maybe jarring for people, but uh, one thing I say in the book, this is pre-pandemic, is that 10% uh, of the most wealthy people in the world were producing 50% of global emissions, okay? And that those 10% of the most wealthy people in the world, and by the way, that's not those wealthy businessmen in New York City, that includes uh, uh, you know, myself and many of those colleagues. You don't need that, you don't need so many assets to be 10% of the wealthiest people in the world, okay? Um, so it was a plea to saying the privileged people of the world have to start thinking seriously about the contributions that they are making to climate emissions and, and rethink the way we live. I would never have wanted this rethinking to have to happen via the coronavirus, but the coronavirus has also forced, is forcing all of us to rethink about how we live. And, and in some ways, the, the intense craziness of, for privileged people of pre-pandemic life. And that is a notion that you just wildly uh, uh, fly all over the world. You know, my colleague going to a one day climate change seminar in Singapore, you're right. Like what, you know, just crazy stuff. Uh, and whether we can have a post-pandemic world where we really question the values of that, uh, of that privileged class that were in some ways connected to the outbreak of the pandemic. Thank you so much, uh, Catherine, Cesar, and everyone, the organizers, and everyone for joining us. And I think in response to the question about roles, I you know, agree with what both of you have said. I think we all play different roles to advance change and in moments of crisis and it's actually critical to have all those roles playing out and the roles and tactics that we use also need to change and evolve with time so even all the wonderful lessons that you've shared today um, will will equally evolve with time so just important to think about roles uh, not as something static or uniform but yeah thank you both so so much it's always so wonderful and inspiring to hear both of you speak and thank you to everyone who was able to join us today. Um, stay safe, hopeful, forward-looking, and think about your responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you, Julika. Bye. Thank you. Bye.